This video contains subject matter that may be offensive and disturbing to some people. If you are the type to require a warning throughout a video or show, let this message serve as your warning. This channel discusses the harsh reality of true crime. If this warning is not sufficient for you, consider a different genre and unsubscribe from my channel immediately. Yo, hey, look at that. The chat's working now, kind of. <laughs> See that? Yeah, it's pretty cool. Figured out some other way you have to do it. You have to re-put the link in every, for every show. But seems like it's working pretty good. Yeah, I'll, I'll probably be wearing something. Might just be my green bodysuit again. Yep. Yeah, this person today said, made a comment. One of the, one of the idiot YouTubers, uh, you know, that makes the, just the really trash videos. Uh, they were saying that. Yeah, I mean, you're you you make money off of this stuff, and I'm like, yeah, yeah. I don't listen, everybody. I don't feel bad at all that I. My channel's monetized, and I have channel members, and I make money. If I made a million dollars a year, I'd be absolutely pumped. But that would also mean I'd be donating a shitload more money, too, right? You know, so that's the thing, is I really don't care at all when people say that. They always think, oh, look, I hit a hot button. No, the hot button is, is that when people complain about YouTubers making money on true crime, they're morons, okay? Because you don't see them don't over there at uh, you know the headquarters of 60 Minutes or IDTV picketing outside, sending them letters or anything like that. No, we're doing our own type of show on YouTube, and that's what the platform's for. It wasn't for oh everybody on YouTube has to do everything for free because you're so much more higher you know, uh, moral superiority than any of the rest of us amazing yeah it, it's just it drives me nuts okay so hell if I made a hundred thousand dollars that means charity would be getting twenty five thousand and then I'd be taxed on the remain the whole amount okay <laughs> but that's a hell of a lot more than anybody else is doing out there and I and and uh, I donate way more than 25 percent that's why I'm not even close to too. So when we're going to get to 20, I didn't make 80, okay? Just trust me on that one. Anyways. I just... Man, I can't. I just... Oh, God, it drives me nuts. So you guys ready to... We're going to be talking about true crime again here, okay? Let me know when you guys are all ready. It's pretty interesting stuff. See, isn't that cool, the chat, how it sort of disappears like that? <laughs> yeah, it'd be cool. We've got to get the, uh, got to keep the channel going because i got to make my donations at the end of the month. Okay, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna get to twenty thousand by the end of the year. Thanks, Zozo. Yes, and I I know it's you know it's tough sometimes, everybody. Hey, look at that. That's cool. Look what the uh, super chat looks like in there. That's almost like the exact uh, shot. Hmm. Yeah, but check it out. Look what I've got now. Look what I've got. I've made. Watch this one. Watch. Poof. <laughs> oh yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Look how cool that is, huh? 
Took me a while to make one that worked. And then uh, if you go over here to the, uh, like if I'm on this one, and then I'm over on this one here, then I click on it, and then it goes. <laughs> See? Not bad, huh? Not bad. Hey, but while I'm in jail, you know, might as well stay here for a little bit. Someone can be the first one to bail me out of the new jail. Look how cool it is, too, because I made it where it's shiny bars. I actually made the entire uh, 3D set. Okay. Hey, thanks, Dana. Yeah, so I think it looks kind of cool the way it is. Even has so mean jail at the top. Everything just sort of pop. Ah. <laughs> Every time I see one, something pop up and then I see it's Lee D, I'm stuck. Okay. Every single time. <laughs> Denied. Yeah, I'll figure something out. How to make it sound like there's bars there. Oh, and thanks, Julie W., for your donation at the end of the show last time. Hey, thanks, Angie Pandy. That'll get me the hell out of there. Now, I think I've made this transition, too. From here back to... Yep, look at that. See, that's cool right there. Denied. Man. Don't you think that's pretty sweet? So you go to the jail. Thank you for all you do for others. And then you have to build another transition out. Look at bang. Now we're back to the main screen. Yeah, it took a while to make that. I gotta, I'm going to make it so that no matter where you are, it does it correctly wherever you're going. Something like that. I've got one more to make. I've got to do the one that goes from... Let's see. So if I'm right here and then I go... Oh yeah, that's the main one, and then that's the jail, but then I can go to this one, then back. Yeah, something was wrong with that one there, so let's see. I'm right there, and then I go to the main one. Uh, I don't know, there was one that I'm missing that I've got to figure out. Oh, you guys got to get... <laughs> Hell, I keep hitting the jail, and you guys keep sending me bail. I'm not trying to do that. I'm just showing you what I'm... Thanks, Lane S. and Lori H. You know, I'm, having, I'm struggling with these people out there. I keep trying to tell them on social media that you shouldn't be putting out side-by-sides of people. And they just keep doing it over and over. I don't give a damn what group you're in or where you're at. You just, you shouldn't do it. Okay? Law enforcement's going to figure it out way before somebody doing a side-by-side -side is. Now, it's possible that one of the millions of people that have been put on social media side-by-side -side will be correct. We just don't know. Huh? Oh boy. Keep an eye out on Space Chicken there. Already too many comments too quickly. Yep. <laughs> ah, wanker, that's a an Aussie term. Alright, let me get to the uh, the cases now. They're pretty weird. I had six of them, but then I stopped at three, and then maybe we'll cold investigate the other three if they, we need time. Alright. What do you mean you emailed me to? Who? Me?
What do you mean, Andrew? What are you talking about? Yeah, so earlier today, uh, Zozo sent me a link from the, uh, you know, the, the, the case with, let me get to the link here. Tiffany Booth, I believe. So the body in the Tiffany Booth case was identified, and it, it is hers. You remember the one where, um, well, let me just, I can do a recap of it. If I can find the, uh, the link, the, the folder, I mean. Man, Tiffany is like such a common name. I must have 50 cases with a Tiffany in it. Yeah, so you remember this is the case where she was in her apartment. And, uh, well, okay, so there's a mother. I'm just going to try to remember this one. And I think it was like the 29th and 30th. They went missing, her and her boyfriend, uh, Tiffany Booth and her boyfriend. But they didn't know they were missing until October 1st because the mother went over to the house, checked the surveillance footage, but apparently on the 29th and 30th, the surveillance footage was deleted. And then they found the vehicle, I believe, on the 8th up in Eli here. And then just recently found her body, uh, a body, over in this area, and it turns out that was her body. And then his phone was pinging all the way up in Idaho or her phone was pinging up in Idaho because it must have still been on. And I think that he is the one that did something to her, dumped her body, probably drove back uh, to, to his, the apartment. And then somehow, I don't know, he must have got a ride or something because at some point the her vehicle was found in... Eli here and then he then her cards being used way up in Idaho okay so anyways her her uh, her body was uh, confirmed to be her the body that was found right here in this town near that town and let's see what the hell the name of that town was it was uh, yeah Indian Springs so her body was found near Indian Springs and then they're also putting out, apparently on one of the websites, a uh, you know a bank robbery way over here. Uh, you don't really know. It's right way over here in a bank. And there's a guy that kind of looks like him. I'm not even going to really play it. If it turns out to be him, then wow, that's crazy. Because then he drove all the way back down from Idaho over to here in some weird loop. Although this here, I don't know what the, I don't remember all the dates, but this bank, I think it was like October 13th or 14th. And then I don't remember when the sightings were up here. So probably we'll have to do a reset of this case in the next couple days. Yeah, it does, does kind of look like him, but we'll just say you think it might be him. You don't really know it's him. Uh, and given your uh, track record of being right, uh, you better switch that up a little bit. Give yourself some leeway. Could very well be him. Who knows? Yeah, nah. I'll, I'll say it's probably not. Okay? Hopefully you win this time. But we're not betting on this one. Nope, not betting. You can bet somebody else 100 buckles. Whatever the hell that is. Because I, I don't know. It does kind of look like him, for sure. Um, I guess I could... I think I have that link. Was this from... Uh, 
Uh, no, that's not it. Okay, here's the uh, here's what she's looking at here. Alright, some guy. So here's here's this individual robbing a bank right there. Apparently he kind of looked like this prior. Well, that's a better picture. Let me go take a look now. Yeah, that does kind of look like him a little bit. That's why I won't bet. I'm saying it could be him, it might not be. Yeah, so you look at this guy right here. He has similar type. Everything looks similar. The hair is similar. He looks like he's probably going to weigh 270 pounds. And uh, he's got glasses on here, but not there. But he's the same kind of head shape, hair going back. Uh, the mask on his face is, you know, that's one of the things that's going around now. It's harder to make people out because you can legitimately be wearing a, a mask. What's his name? Eduardo again? Let me see. Hold on. And the FBI is looking into it, but the FBI looks into all robberies. Or bank robberies. They're always in there. Eduardo Clemente. Okay. I don't know if that's him. It sort of looks like him on here. Is that him right there? That looks kind of like one of those other pictures. Hold on, let me see. That looks like that's him. Yeah, I think that is him right there. So here, I'm going to check something out. Oh, I think that's even her right there. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. Let's see if there's another one. It's interesting that he's the first one that pops up for no particular reason. I wish there was a body shot here where we could do more of a comparison. And then I was hoping to maybe even try to find that shirt. I mean, that very well could be. They posted this in some other group out there. So this could be, uh, you know, it's hard to tell. The glasses kind of throw you off a little bit, but that's usually what people bank robbing do. They put a pair of glasses on, a couple things here and there, and then all of a sudden it's hard to really make to tell. But, you know, to be honest, it does kind of look like it could be him, right? I mean, it's in the same general time frame when he's out on the run. He'd need money, right? Probably didn't want to keep using the debit card. And then we've got same hair style. Looks like he could possibly weigh the 260 that they were talking about. And, uh, you know, same general color hair, that kind of thing. So I'll just say, you know, give it like 80%, maybe 70, something like that.
What are you what are you referring to, Susie? I'm trying to figure out what you guys are talking about. I can't. No, I'm not. You're not owing me anything because I didn't bet you on this one, Zozo. If it's not him, um, you don't owe me anything. I, because I don't feel. I mean, I feel like there's a decent chance it could be him too. And it looks way more like this picture to me, because this is probably more recent, I would imagine, than the shot we were just looking at. And that looks like, that's kind of what he looks like, right there. See? What do you mean he weighed 180 recently? It says on the thing, the missing, the actual flyer that he weighs 260. I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't buy it. Okay. Hey, why don't you go tell Violet Beauregard that, Veruca? Not really interested. Now he's got the super sleuth showing up. Oh, yeah! <laughs> well, we got He's really into hacking. He's got this... Uh, uh, who knows? Okay. Or maybe, you know, get a hold of Mike TV. He'll probably be interested. Well, you said you just had had enough, so I was trying to figure out what you were referring to. I know it wasn't me, but I just wanted to see if I was noticing something like that, too. Nah. I, I just, I'm doing it right now. That's, that's it right there. That's him right there. I'm not, you know, this, this is the, I don't know when this shot is, right? I mean, in this one, he's got really much darker hair, but he looks like he's pretty heavy. The other one, he looked thinner. Yeah, gotcha, gotcha, yeah. Not interested. We'll just do our own thing. If it turns out that that's okay, great. Yeah, it's in that. It's in another group, a group that, you know, trashes me into oblivion. So forget it. You can go do your own super sleuthing by repeating everything that they're saying. All right. Uh, let's see. She must have her own Facebook, I would imagine. Okay, there's that one. It's weird how she pops up first and he does, just typing in a name. There's no reason for it. They've been dating for a long time, right? <laughs> He's like, he looks just looks like a psycho. Okay. Anyways, I'm gonna switch off of this. I'm not really, you know, that interested right now. I just wanted to give you the update that the body was actually found. So you guys can go back and do your own. Um, All right, there we go. We're going to go ahead and uh, switch topics now. Veruca, you can go do your, you know, start your own channel, do whatever you're going to do over there. Be good stuff, okay? Uh, not interested in just reading chats. That's what other channels do. Now, if people wanted to send this to me before, that would be great, you know, but I don't, I didn't, I don't have that information.
I don't do the thing where I read the chat and just uh, hope that somebody's correct. Yeah, it looks it looks crazy. All right. Oh yeah, and also Scott Peterson was given a new trial for the the penalty phase, which is interesting, but it doesn't change anything that he'll be in there for the rest of his life. And he was going to be in there for the rest of his life anyways because there was never going to be a an execution that came forth anyways. So I don't know why anybody really cares. What's cool is, hey, you get to hear the trial again. Go over the information again. Yeah, I, I'm almost 100% sure that Eduardo, he didn't plan it very well. He thought he was. You know, deleting the surveillance and all that, and it just—it's it, just really obvious. Okay, so they're gonna have to—they'll go out and find him, and it'd be interesting to see if it turns out that he is the one that robbed the bank. That'd be cool. Yeah, but there's no doubt in my mind that he's responsible for what's going on. None at all. Yeah, and he obviously must have had her phone still on. But you know what? He could have done that intentionally, except he moronically bought something. See, if he was smart, he would have driven all the way up there with her phone and then left it somewhere and not purchased a damn thing in Idaho and then driven all the way back, do the whole Jody Arias thing. <laughs> except in her case, she blew it there too, right? I mean, it's just... All right. Okay. So now I'm going to switch over to. Uh, well, there was one. Oh, another one. <laughs> that I was going to look at. I mean, this was pretty crazy. Homicide victim found inside purple suitcase in Chippewa County. The female body that was found in the town of Wheaton last Wednesday was stuffed in a purple suitcase. That's according to a report from the National Institute of Justice. They seem to be in Katrina vogue Lynn all of a sudden. Today following suitcase. leads in an attempt to find out who this woman was. Katrina, what do we know? Well, according to a report from the National Missing and Unidentified Person System, or NAMIS, the woman was wearing black stretch pants and a black yeah, t-shirt like that reads sight. Sprecher's Restaurants and Pub, which is located in the Wisconsin Dells. Now, this is the abandoned farmhouse off of County Highway T between 20th and 30th Avenue in Chippewa County, where the body was found last week. As the leader telegram first reported, the woman's name is likely Rosalie. The victim has long black hair and a contact lens was found among the remains. The Reedsburg Police Department near the Dells confirmed uh, fun, they took a missing persons report of a Rosalie Rodriguez on July 21. However, authorities do not have a positive ID yet on the body. The Reedsburg Police Chief says Rodriguez was working in Lake Delton and living in Reedsburg. Okay, thanks Katrina. Last week, Chippewa County Sheriff Jim Kowalczyk told us there is a person of interest, but there is nobody in custody. Leader Telegram first reported the woman's name is likely Rosalie. The victim has long black hair and a contact lens was found among the remains. The Reedsburg Police Department near the Dells confirmed they took a missing persons report of a Rosalie Rodriguez on July 21. However, authorities do not have a positive ID yet on the body. The Reedsburg police chief says Rodriguez was working in Lake Delton and living in Reedsburg. Okay, thanks, Katrina. Last week. Huh. I'm trying to see where that is. Yeah, I thought it was up in this area. Our, the name Chippewa was a word that I remembered from the wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald. So I was thinking, well, it must be up there near, you know, 
Lake Michigan or something. <laughs> Uh, so Chippewa County, so this is in Wisconsin it looks like. <clears throat> Got the abandoned property found dead in Chippewa County last week. So somewhere in this area. You're dead, huh? Weird. That's weird, Carly. Most of the time when people are dead, they can't type. It's strange. Anyways, I'll probably look at that one a little bit tomorrow. I'll see what I can find out about that one. That sounds crazy. I don't know where... I'll have to go. I'm sure there's articles that are a little bit more specific, and then. But anyways, I just wanted to throw those out there for now, and then I'm going to get to the three more missing, or not missing, but unsolved cases out of Florida yet again. Who who's who's trying to be hip? Oh, you mean to say I'm dead? I just thought, what did I say that was funny? I guess. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy yeah get you goomy right. the beach man you guys are you guys drinking tonight man half the comments have zero they're just not they're not even related to each other it's almost less like I'm the uh, Zimbabwe. Hey, look Oh, blood. I mean, it's like it's crazy. Like the one person will say, "Yeah, I got a chocolate donut last night. It tastes great." Oh, great! My dog was peeing on the floor five hours ago. Spaghetti tastes good. Chicken isn't bad, but I, you know, it's just. Oh, I think I need a drink. You know what? I'm going to go have a drink, and then I'm going to see if it'll, everything will make sense. All right, but don't forget, everybody, we on this channel have donated $15,500. As you can see, well, it doesn't have the total here, but it has the numbers down here. 2700 to the Kyron Horman Foundation. So if you're new to this channel and you don't know what we do on here, throughout the month, Super Chats come in, I get... Uh, ad, you know, three hundred dollars a month ad revenue, <laughs> horrible, and then channel membership, and I take all of that, and then I give a percentage, and then I also add money to it from PayPal or whatever, and we've donated fifteen thousand five hundred dollars this year, and twenty seven hundred of it's gone to Kyron Horman Foundation for the Allison Watterson case, Wounded Blue Fund got five hundred dollars. The DNA Doe Project got 2300 That's for um, unidentified Jane and John Doe. Rain, Violence Against Women, 1000 They test the old uh, rape kits and self-explanatory. NICMEC, $2,100. Texas EquiSearch, 5000 NICMEC is the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. And uh, 5000 we've given to Texas EquiSearch. And then I think... We've given 900 to the Innocence Project. You know, I was, I was on this page today, and they were talking about that movie. I think it's called, like, 83 Days or something. And, you know, I was just saying that, you know, it's not always, it's not always about race. I mean, obviously that case was about, that race was part of the case. But to me, there's a lot of these wrongfully convicted people out there that are, it's just, it's ludicrous. So I, I'd like to give more to the Innocence Project at some point here. All right? So there you go, everybody. So just know that when you send in Super Chats or whatever, it go, there, there's more meaning to it. It's not just me collecting. All right? And that's really main, the main goal of the entire channel. Uh, as to 
investigate cases, uh, maybe try to do it in an, in an entertaining way, and then you know make it so that the channel can survive, you know where it's worth doing it every single night, and then also be able to donate a ton of money to charity and make a difference actually. Backlav is so rich. Not sure what that means. Yep. All right. So I'm gonna go. What I'm gonna do now? I'm just gonna go get myself a. Uh, I'm gonna get a, have a drink. <laughs> I need one. Especially since speeches like that don't have any effect. All right, here we go. Sonic Bro him having one also. Thanks, Cairo. Yeah, I made myself a, uh, no, it's just lemonade and a little bit of, uh, I don't have any mixer, anything like that. But I did have my, I had a shot and uh, some uh, lemonade with the little bit of gin that I had left. I thought I had more gin, but I guess not.
That's okay. People are all burnout. <laughs> uh, let's see. All right, so I'm going to start off with this first. I haven't mapped them out or anything like that. Maybe what I'll do is just make the f folders really quick. Thanks, Zozo. You're throwing it at Michelle Nicholas? Thanks, Linda Molden Howe. As in Linda Molden Howe of the Cattle Mutilations and Crop Circle fame. picture throwing her. my money at Michelle Nicklaus money bag I'm trying to picture her out there mutilating cattle cheers tumbler glass Oh yeah, well by the way, this is what I have right here. It's just sort of like lemonade and a uh, little bit of gin. Tumbler glass koala. Oh yeah? You know what I like are those uh, coffee frappuccino drinks. Those are pretty good. Okay, well, here we go. We're going to get started now. So the first case here is... Oh, so it's back in 87. Yeah, so it's Opal Wheel 1987. All right. Thanks, Darlene. What did what did uh, what happened to Michelle? <laughs> oh, sh oh, she's got. Uh, I see. <laughs> she's doing a little dance for you guys. I get it. Well, you should have you should have called in on Zoom on that one, Michelle Nicholas. You know, might have been uh, interesting to uh, watch. <laughs> you know. <laughs> That's all you're giving your God, you guys. Two dollars? Well, she's up there with the coins. L O L. <laughs> oh yeah, next time, Michelle, we'll get you on Zoom. Just stand back in the background. Yeah, you know what's crazy, Crystal Wreath is that's probably somebody's favorite song. You know. You know that song Roller Coaster that was put out in like the 70s? Just think about this. Like almost every song, that is somebody's favorite song. Although I, I, would, make, I would make a bet that that can't be. That's one of the shittiest songs that's ever ma been made of, of all kind. I mean, it's just... Yeah, but see... It's a terrible song. I, I, I bring it up just so that, like, to make fun of people. 
who think that's their favorite song of all time. Right up there with S A T U R D A Y D I N A T U R. You know, the Bay City Rollers. Yeah, Roller Coaster of Love. God, give me a break. What a terrible song that was. Jesus. Roller Coaster! <laughs> <laughs> it was just so bad. It was, it's like, what are we going to write a song about? Today? Hey, you know what? Just type in roller coaster. We'll have a little, wah, 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 you know, crappy, you know. Oh, that's just terrible. Basically, the roll, rollers were a one hit wonder. You know, that's it. They would go do a concert, play one song, and leave. Or they would just put that on an endless loop like that one song that we've got. Yeah. All right, here we go. Ready? Yeah, you always think, though, if somebody is like, wow, that's your favorite song. <laughs> it's like loving a painting that has a line drawn on it. And then somebody explains what the line means. And now you love the painting. Okay, the body of an elder, elderly w widow was found God, at her home early Monday. And authorities said they are investigating the death as a murder. The body of Opal A. Wheel, 82, she's 82 years old, was discovered at 8 a.m. Monday after a relative went to check on her after she failed to answer the, her telephone. Mrs. Wheel was last seen alive about 12 hours earlier, authorities said. After a day of combing through Mrs. Wells' neatly kept home at, now we can get it exactly where it is, at 47, 47, 36, 56 Avenue, North. Leal, no, there it is, Lealman, Florida, right there. And right now we are working the Opal Wheel. It's crazy. You know, all these kind of homes like this are, they've been there the whole time. Forty-seven, thirty-six. So it's that one right there, and you can tell just by looking at it that that house has easily been there that whole time. Okay, the body of Opal A. Wheel. Okay, I got. I'm gonna wait. Are you guys done with the uh, the songs and all that kind of stuff? I know I started it, but. We got to give the the focus on uh, this case here. I know it's me that keeps bringing it back up. <laughs> now, after a day of combing through Mrs. Wheel's neatly kept home at 4736 56th Avenue North in Lillman area, officials of the Pinellas County Sheriff's Department would say little about the death. I can't release anything regarding the circumstances surrounding the homicide, said Department Spokesman Lieutenant John, uh, let's see, Lachichio. An autopsy was underway Monday by the Pinellas County Medical Examiner's Office. Results of the autopsy might be available by today. On Monday, Mrs. Wheel's wine-colored Chevrolet was parked in the driveway, so she hadn't left or anything. Everything about the house seemed normal, 
neighbor said, except for the open door to a Florida room in the area of the home. What's a Florida room? Wait. Except for the open door to a Florida room. It has Florida in capital. Not sure. I guess just because it's Florida. but In the rear of the home. Oh, like a little sunroom. That's probably what they're saying. Oh, and their fiber sleuth said the same thing, but yeah. Yep. So something back here. That door, back door was open. Uh, he said they would not confirm whether the door was found ajar. By late afternoon, Bacciccio said officials had no suspect. Crime technicians videotaped the interior, interior of the small house and used a vacuum and laser equipment in their quest for evidence. That's pretty interesting. Mrs. Wheel's brother and his wife live only a few doors to the east on 56th Avenue. Their, their daughter was answering the door and taking telephone calls saying her parents were in seclusion. News of the death shocked neighbors. Most of, most of them are retirees. They knew Mrs. Wheels as a tall, slim, well-dressed woman who took regular morning and afternoon strolls, often accompanied by two men who lived nearby. Miss Wheel would pass the home of Marilyn Graham and always stop to speak if Mrs. Graham was outside, she always looked beautiful, Mrs. Graham said. She was as lovely on the inside as she was on the outside. Monday morning, neighbors searched their memories for unusual sounds they might have heard the night before. A neighbor across the street said he and his wife were watching television when he heard a loud noise like a bang about 7 or 8 p.m. Sunday. Declining to give his name, the neighbor said the house was enough to make me go outside and nose around. The neighbor said the noise oh the noise was enough, not the house. I was like, what do you mean the house was enough? <laughs> so I had to go back up and read it. Was enough to make me go outside and nose around. Okay, so what was that again? Neighbor across the street said he and his wife were watching television when he heard a loud noise like a bang at about seven or eight. Okay. Ronald Rice lives behind Miss Wheel and was certain his dog would have barked had anyone gone into his backyard at that night. If I had heard anything, I would have been over there in a, in a flash. Neighbors said other things have been unusual in the neighborhood. Mrs. Graham said she regarded... Or excuse, excuse me, regretted not calling the. It, it's kind of weird print, so it's hard for me to. Like you guys can probably read it, but it's like it's not solid for my my brain and eyes to read. Yeah, I'm sure it's kind of like a sunroom off the living room. Yeah. Miss Graham said she regretted not calling the sheriff's department. Uh, more than a week ago when one of her sons stopped at her house between 4 and 5 a.m. to pick up his brother and saw a man standing in his mother's driveway. My son asked, asked him what he was doing, said Mrs. Graham. He said he was waiting for someone. He said the man then left. Huh. So let's see. Stopped at her house between 4 and 5 to pick up his brother not calling the sheriff department more than a week ago when one of her sons stopped at her house between four and five to pick up his brother and saw a man standing in his mother's driveway. My son asked him what he was doing. He said he was waiting for someone and then the man just left. However, Kersey said he still doesn't know who set fire to Christmas decorations on a table in the garage prior to the holiday. He said he had left the garage door 
partly open when the incident occurred. That was probably just some stupid kids or something. It couldn't have been started by itself, Gersey said. Somebody had to start it. So I guess there was a fire in the garage as well. Yeah, so crazy. There's actually another case that's right around the same time. Pinell Sheriff's Detectives Friday began their second investigation in five days into the death of an elderly widow found slain in her home. So I might, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch over to that one. This one is Eleanor Swift. So here we go. Elderly woman found murdered in Seminole. So this is her story now. And then I'll go back to the other one. An elderly woman was found murdered in her Ridge Road home Friday, a day before she would have celebrated her 86th birthday. So another really old, you know, quite a bit older person. Eleanor Swift's body was found by her grandson about noon Friday in her house at 7801. So now we'll put that one in and go to... What did I do with that link? Oh, right there. Jeez. 7801. Ridge Road. And this is in Seminole. So it's not, shouldn't be too far away from here. It's in the same county. And this is literally just four days later, by the way, you know, or like within a week. Let's see. He declined to say if Mrs. Swift's well-kept one-story house, see again, it's weird how it sounds similar, well-kept and everything, was broken into or release any other details about her death. She was last seen early Thursday evening outside her house on the northeast corner of Park Boulevard and Ridge Road. It is the second murder of an elderly woman in mid Pinellas this week. Opal Wheel 82 was found dead at 8 a.m. Monday by a relative who became concerned because Mrs. Wheel did not answer her telephone. Miss Wheel also lived alone. She was last seen alive 12 hours before her body was found in her house at 4736.56. Sheriff Gary Coleman, or Jerry Coleman, <laughs> not Gary, he's the actor, said it is uncertain if the two deaths are linked. Some circumstances in both murders are similar, such as the age of the victims. No information about the cause of death of either woman has been re released. We have, to, we have two apparent homicide cases with some apparent similarities, but we can't say more than that now, Coleman said. He added the investigators have a suspect in Mrs. Wheel's murder. Uh, Mrs. Swift's neighbor, many of them elderly, gathered outside Friday along Ridge Road and nervously talked, about them, talked among themselves. They questioned deputies and anyone who would speak to them trying to find out what happened. One elderly woman cornered Coleman and, and told him she lives alone and her house security alarm system is inoperable. That's the sheriff. She said, hey, sheriff, my, you know, my alarm's not working. Another neighbor on Ridge Road, Sally Sims, watched and worried her daughter's bicycle was stolen from their garage last week, she said. We're hoping whoever did this is a stranger. She described Miss Swift as a careful person 
who kept to herself. Miss Swift rarely had company except for relatives. She was very private, said Mrs. Sims. I think she was afraid of living alone. She always kept her house really closed up. Neighbor W.E. Wackenhuth remembered seeing Miss Swift outside at her mailbox about 4 p.m. Thursday. Soon after she went back inside, he took an aluminum ladder over and fixed her light in the front yard. I had a notion to knock on the door and tell Eleanor I fixed her light, but I didn't. And he says, I guess I should have. See? That's how neighbors used to be. You know, they just sort of go fix something. So this is probably a similar article, but from her, the other victim, Opal's point of view, I guess. At both houses paid close attention to indications that the homes had been broken into through the back door. At Wheel's home, a screen and window pane had been removed from the back door. At Swift's home, the back door to the garage stood open. Authorities also photographed a broken section of telephone line leading into Swift's house, but Lieutenant John Buciccio would not say whether the line had been cut. Swift and Wheel lived about six miles apart. Wheel lived in an unincorporated neighborhood near the Lillman section of northern St. Petersburg. Like Wheel, Swift lived alone in a well-kept home surrounded by mostly elderly retired neighbors. Both neighborhoods have no street lights and are very dark at night. Coleman said Swift was last seen by neighbors during evening several Neighbors interviewed Friday said they had neither seen nor heard anything unusual during the night. Swift, who would have been 86 today, lived in a white house with brick facing less than a half mile from Seminole Mall. Neighbors said a yardman came o over once a week to tend to a variety of tropical plants, including three kinds of palm trees. Uh, Coleman would not say whether he planned to increase patrols in the unincorpor uh, unincorporated Pinellas County. Uh, let's see. To me, this is too close, said 70-year-old Mary Jane Carlson, who lives north of Swift on Ridge Road. Because something happens down here doesn't mean something won't happen up there, too. No, no, hey, hey, B, B Hillis, you're the one that's rude, okay? Somebody's talking about a completely different case that deserves the same respect as every other case out there, and you call in and want to ask a question about Delphi. Jesus, you're, you're a lunatic. Hey, Grant, stop your show right now so I can call in and ask a question about Delphi. Yeah. Right, give me a break, all right? Okay, then four months later, we got this one right here. Sarah Ledbetter has bright spotlights on all sides of her home. So she set up a crime watch, basically. I'm not going to go through the whole... Because of that case. I know, but don't you think that's kind of rude, B. Hillis? Seriously, just a little bit? Yeah, well, I don't care if they leave my channel for that. What's ludicrous is somebody like you that doesn't come to the show. You don't have to hide that person, okay? I'm going to unhide that. You come to the show, and right in the middle of the show... You know, I barely read any comments. I just saw one random comment that was in there. And you come in there and want to call in about Delphi. 
when I'm literally in the middle of talking about completely different cases. Do you understand how that's just ludicrous? Okay? That's not normal. That's not what normal people do. Normal people come into a, a, a show and they see what they're talking about. And then they ask if they can call in about that topic. If there's even a line open. I don't care, B. Hillis. Okay? Just admit that what you did was wrong and have a good night. All right? If you can't do it, then, you know, bon voyage, whatever the hell the term is. Bon voyage. Been following you for a while. Relax, man. I just stopped on. Right, right. I just hopped on. Have a good one. See, that's just so passive aggressive, people like that, you know? You come in, you're the one that was rude, and then you get mad at other people for saying, hey, you know. <laughs> it's just it's, it's unbelievable. It's crazy. It's embarrassing, really. Unreal. Unreal. Yeah, so I guess this is 10 years later. Okay, deputies still seek clues in murders. They were elderly women of modest means, lived alone, and had their wedding rings pulled from their fingers. See, this seems like a weird sort of, I don't know if it's a serial killer, but it's somebody who, well, I guess it would be a serial killer if he killed one more, regardless of how you want to look at it. But usually with serial killers, you have to have a sort of a, it's a mental, you know, if you're just killing for robbery sakes, I don't know if you're in that same mold. Thanks, Lee D. Been a slow night. Yeah, so authorities made a public plea Thursday for help in finding the lone unidentified attacker responsible for the terror of 10 years ago in the central Pinellas County. Their deaths remain unsolved and detectives are using this anniversary week to ask for the public's help in the investigations. Opal Wheel, an 82-year-old widow, was found dead the morning of February 9, 1987 in the bedroom of her home at 4736 56th Avenue North. The Georgia native, who once worked as a buyer for a department store, had been beaten and strangled. Wow, that's crazy. The killer broke in by removing glass from a rear door to the family room, cut telephone lines, wow, and armed himself with a kitchen knife which was left behind, said Sheriff Sergeant Greg Tita. Uh, so what do you, let's see, what do you do again? Beaten and strangled, but he had a knife. Used a knife as a, probably a subduing type weapon. Uh, Wheel had not sexually assaulted, but her wedding ring was yanked from her finger. He said, a straight brown Caucasian hair was found at the scene, perhaps providing the best clue. Well, I hope you guys still have that. Okay. Four days later, see it was just four days, Um, and six miles away in Seminole, Elmore Swift was found slain in her home at 7801 Ridge Road. The widow, born in New York State and a former secretary for a publishing company, had been suffocated by a pillow or couch cushion. So, simil you know, another asphyxiation, one by strangulation and this one by smothering.
Yeah, that's okay, B. Hillis. I, I, I don't give a shit. Thanks for sticking up for me. I don't even believe that you did. I think you're just a troll trying to create havoc on a channel, okay? Because you didn't even apologize for your rude behavior. You just kept going and going and going, all right? So just get the hell out of here, all right? Embarrassing. Oh, to think that I go. Oh. To think that I still go for you. Listen, if you come here and you ask me to talk about a case right in the middle of a show about another case, you're rude. I don't think there's anybody in the world that doesn't think that. Okay? So go cry somewhere else. And here's another thing. That isn't even your name on there. Nobody knows who the hell you are. So you can come in here and say whatever the hell you want. I think that everybody in here realizes what you did was very rude. Okay. Hey, Greg, can I call in about Delphi? I don't even have a phone number up. And I'm talking about a case that probably hasn't been talked about in years. I've never seen it before. And you just want to talk about the same thing. Why don't you go start your own channel and just have people call in. Okay. I'm sure you'll do great. What a clown. Jesus. And I really, listen, don't stick up for me ever again. I, I, don't, I don't want somebody like you doing it because it won't come off right. You'll probably do it in a stupid way. Well, I know he's a rude asshole, but hey, I'll tell you what, he's, you know. Listen, I, I don't need it. I think it's ludicrous what you did. And you should admit it and realize it. And it would have been, we would have moved on right away. Instead, you didn't do that. Yeah, I, I tell you what, you know, the Delphi case is the case that I want solved more than any other case. But the people out there, the general public and the Facebook groups and all the stuff that cover it are idiots. It's, it's brought forth some of the, the most moronic, idiotic people that I've ever seen. And it makes me nervous about the world, okay, because it shows you how stupid people are okay and um, thankfully on this channel we have the other end of that equation I sort of weeded out the dumbasses okay it is literally insane the stuff that people talk about they take a picture uh, put about 75,000 filters on it turn it into something that looks like a cross between a zombie and a psychological inkblot test and they go, oh, look at this. And as if that's supposed to help somebody. Okay? It is ludicrous. Okay? And I've never seen a case bring out so many absolutely moronic people. Now, I appreciate that the case is being talked about. But can you do it in a way that's respectable, that's actually meaningful, and might actually lead to something? You know, putting up these side-by-sides of every Tom, Dick, and Harry. Here's another joke by Zozo coming up. Is just literally... <laughs> it's just... Uh, God. We, you know what's crazy? It, it's starting up again. Like it had sort of died down, all the garbage. And then it just sort of got brought up again for, for an unknown reason. And look at me right now. I thought this was really interesting, what we were just talking about. And, of course, we got taken backwards in time. Oh, really? Crazy. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, it could be, like, in Florida, you have older people that retire there. They have money. There could be, you know, a psycho that is robbing them. And, you know, older people don't leave their house as much. You know, when you're like 85 and, you know, you kind of stay at home. So it wouldn't be a situation where you could wait for somebody to leave. You'd have to break in and do something. You know, probably kill them because then they'd recognize you. But why not just sort of wear a mask or something and blindfold them? You know what I mean? Like, you know, why do you have to kill and 85. See, that's where there's the psycho kind of... My aunt was murdered in Florida to Gray Unsolved. That's Helen where there's... Townsend, yeah. age 90 in 2015. Thanks. Hollywood, Florida. <laughs> Thanks. 
Thanks, Kim F. Sharp. Yeah, so the thing is, when you got somebody old like that, all you have to do is put a mask on really quick, tie him up, you would have stolen some things, got the hell out of there. There's no reason to kill them. So at that point, that's where you get into that serial killer mode, like because he wanted to kill him. There's no reason to have to kill an 82, 86-year-old woman, right? So let me go back to this part again before we were rudely interrupted by the same freaking idiot again. All right. Opal Wheel, an 82-year-old widow, was found dead the morning of February 9, 1987, in the bedroom. The killer broke in by removing glass from a rear door to the family room, cut telephone lines, and armed himself with a kitchen knife, which was held behind... which was... What, excuse me, which was left behind. So that's weird. They must have his fingerprints then. And maybe even DNA because he gripped it, unless he was wearing gloves. But it's weird that he used a knife as a sort of a control weapon, but that wasn't used in the murder. Uh, Wheel was not sexually assaulted, but her wedding ring was yanked from her finger, he said. A straight, round Caucasian hair was found at the scene perhaps providing the best clue. So hopefully they still have that here. Hey, thanks, Donna Bolton. Megazoid. Ta -ta -na -na. Okay, now let's go to the next page. Four days later, and six miles away in Seminole, in Seminole, Eleanor Swift was found slain in her home at 7801 Ridge Road, and that's where we're at right now. And I can even prove it to you by zooming in, and you can see it says 7801. The widow, born in New York State and a former secretary for a publishing company, had been suffocated by a pillow or couch cushion. So this is where I was saying it's similar, another asphyxiation murder. She would have been 85 the next day. Wow, how shitty is that? The intruder cut a plastic window next to an air conditioning unit in the back of the family room and cut the telephone lines again. So now we've got the telephone lines again. So this is basically is the same killer. As a matter of fact, I was looking at him on this website, and I thought, wow, those might be related. And then when I looked up each individual case on the site, it was actually the police site, they said that they think these two are related. And it's, it's pretty obvious, really. As in the first case, the victim was not sexually assaulted, but her wedding ring was forcibly removed yet again. Again, a strange brown Caucasian hair was left behind. Just one, though? I mean, that's weird. Again, that there's just one, right? Maria L. 75 of 8010 42nd Street in Pinellas Park was beaten, choked, and left for dead February 20th. Let's see where that is. Huh. That sounds different. Well, choked and beaten. So, 8010 42nd. That's crazy. I didn't know that. Ah, okay. Pinellas. Wow. Look at this. That's crazy. I, I guarantee these are, this is related. It just has to be. And this is uh, Maria Ells. So there's Eleanor, Opal, Maria Ells. These two are really close. Right here. Wow. 
Uh, hmm. So Maria L seventy five. She was beaten and choked. And remember the remember in the first case she was beaten, right? The second one she was just smothered. Probably too old to fight. Uh, sheriff's sheriff's investigators working the the wheel case and swift cases took note immediately because of the similarities in the cases. We believe the ring is significant because it's probably a trophy. I wonder if he took the ring of Maria Ells, though. Ells, well, see, Ells wasn't much help to detectives in what Derek described as one of the more unusual aspects of the case. Ells appeared to have spent much of the time after the assault in a daze. She remembered she had been asleep about 6 a.m. when she was attacked but she remembered little else, including what her attacker looked like. And she didn't seek help for six hours. In fact, she did some laundry. See, just total shock. And read the newspaper. Have you ever heard those cases where somebody gets, like, literally shot in the head and they start doing things that are normal, you know, like regular things? Man. Man. She remembered she had been asleep about 6 a.m. when she was attacked, but she remembered little else, including what her attacker looked like. And she didn't seek help for six hours. In fact, she did some laundry and read the newspaper before showing up at her neighbor's door with a bloody nose, red marks on her throat. So she probably was in total shock, almost completely, I mean, the guy probably thought she was dead and bruises and scrapes on her arms, legs, and shoulder blades. The assailant had used a trowel-like tool he found in Elle's carport to pry open her door and left the tool behind yet again, like the knife from earlier. But there were no fingerprints on it. Well, hmm. It appeared he tried suffocating Elle's and at one point dragged her across her house and he robbed her. The thief rifled through Elsa's perch, uh, excuse me, purse and jewelry case, and took a wedding band off her hand. Oh, that's definitely the same guy. And now he's a serial killer. Although he didn't get the third kill in, he meant to kill her. So he would have been. Other jewelry later determined missing, including a turquoise medallion, a butterfly pendant, and a Philadelphia College of pharmacy and science ring engraved with Sister Maria Aperl 1941. Wow. <laughs> this is crazy. Freaking serial killer of elderly. Uh, Derek said investigators hope to identify the assailant by linking some of the stolen, uh, stolen uh, merchandise to him, perhaps through a pawn shop, but this didn't happen. See, this article we're doing right now is Ten years later. And remember, the other two cases were, I think, February 9th, February 13th, and this case we were just talking about was the 22nd of February that year. They also tried linking some hair with a suspect, but there wasn't a match. In 1989, someone started making um, obscene telephone calls to Els, who had since moved. So Els is the one that survived. Wow. Who had since moved to Largo. Authorities put a trace on the line, but the call stopped before they could determine who was making them. Jeez. Els died June 3rd, 1990. Court records show. So it literally just you know, three years later. Apparently, naturally. Derek said he was pretty sure her death was not related to the attack. In her will, she left $36,500 promissory note to Rogate Lutheran Church. Tita said investigators have not been able to identify a suspect, but that attack stopped after Pinellas Park incident. Further, he said... So the Pinellas Park is at Ells. God, that's so crazy. He just quit. Three, done. Um, 
in the attacks has not been seen in Tampa Bay area since the authorities. Let me see. Tita said investigators have not been able to identify a suspect, but that the attack stopped after the Pinellas Park incident. Further, he said the modus operandi, you know, his M.O. <laughs> in the attacks has not been seen in the Tampa Bay area since the authorities theorized the killer moved from the area. This investigation is cold, Derek said. The only way we're going to solve it is if the bad guy or somebody who knows the bad guy... Well, listen, they've got three items that he possibly held and two hairs, right? So they need to be... Let's see. God, I, I didn't look this up recently. Let me check this out. Opal wheel murder oh this is oh I, I have that article right there that was 97 okay let's go to that article then so here is 30 years of not knowing and I don't know who this is right here but Kathy Corey holds a family portrait taken in December 1986 that's her right there, then. I don't know if you can see it, but... Uh, Bob Corey can't tear himself away from true crime television. He watches cases solved on hair strands and saliva, wondering how things would be different if that golden ticket evidence was found on the scene where his grandmother was killed 30 years ago this month. See, this is right before the Golden State Killer, so you'd think that they would be right on top of this right away here. He watches until the very end, even the case seems unsolvable, hoping to witness the closure he and his family still don't have. Some of these Seem like there's no answer, and at the end, some little piece comes up, and boom, said Corey, who was 62. People don't always get answers, but it's sure nice when they do. It was on February 13, 1987, the day before Eleanor Swift's 85th birthday, that she was found dead. Someone broke into her Seminole home and suffocated her with a couch cushion, detectives said. Her death came... Four days after 82nd year old or 82 year old Opal Wheel was found beaten and choked to death in her Lilman home. Pinellas County Sheriff's Office detectives believe the case are related in both the killer pried or cut open a back door or window to enter the single-story homes in which they lived alone. In both, a strand of straight brown Caucasian hair was left behind. In both, the attacker stole just one thing from the window. Wedding rings. Hey, thanks, Karen Kay. I appreciate it. Police also linked a third case. So that is linked, that other one. Happy Friday, freaks throwing kisses. That's right. And just think of me as a cup of coffee on a Friday night, all right? You know, doing this whole show here. Karen K. <laughs> so kind. Police also linked a third case out of Pinellas Park. Maria L. 75 lived through her attack, going to a neighbor's house covered in blood to get help. Investigators believe the attacker may have tried to suffocate her with a couch cushion as well and stole her wedding ring along with other jewelry. Sheriff detectives declined to comment on the unsolved cases, but family members remember the eerie details. I've gotten a lot of things, said Wheel's niece. But this I can see as clear as day. 
Smith was at work as a secretary February 9, 1987, when she got the phone call from a neighbor telling her, come quickly, that her mother couldn't take it, she said last week. I'm not sure what that means. She dashed to the home at 70, 4736 56th Avenue North and saw the police cars. Inside, she saw her aunt's legs through the door of her bedroom. Oh, that's right, her mother came. She found her mother on the back porch shaken, so this is the sister of the victim, already worried they would never find the killer. My mother had a lot of premonitions that were true. A few miles away, Rebecca Corey Overholzer, not Oberholzer, Dennis, heard the TV in her parents' living room blaring news of the slang. Her heart sank not knowing that just four days later her brother and his wife would discover her own grandmother dead under similar mysterious circumstances. Kathy Corey and her husband at the time, Pat, drove to Swift's home at 7801 Ridge Road with their two-year-old son to pick up her, pick her up for a birthday lunch. They knocked on her door with no answer, unusual for Swift, whom Kathy Corey said, was prompt and organized. Pat Corey used the neighbor's phone to call his grandmother, again getting no answer. They used a spare key Swift kept, uh, kept under her water heater to enter the home through a back door that led into the garage, Kathy Corey said. The door to the house was open, a relief for the family who assumed she must not have heard them at the door because she was in the garage. It's fascinating to me now, or me, me, how, let's see. It's fascinating to me how me people, <laughs> okay. See, that one isn't me this time. It's fascinating to me how me, so it's probably fascinating to me how people rationalize things as you go along. They called out, Grandma, Grandma, everything in the, in the house was, was neat as a pin. She said, not noticing a white cushion missing from the living room sofa. She went to check Swift's bedroom to see if she was getting dressed. Instead, she found her lying uh, in bed with the cushion covering her head. What's weird is, how come you can't breathe through a cushion? You know, like, I've always wondered that because they're, they're not like it's... It's not like duct tape or something. But obviously it does work somehow. Um, a book sat on the nightstand. Again, she rationalized. Grandma must have been reading the you uh, and used the cushion to prop herself up. When she moved it, Swift was still her skin cold and pale, save for a half dollar size bruised on, bruise on her chin. So that means, must mean she'd live for just a little bit. Like she, he got, she got punched in the face. Because uh, that's interesting that there's a bruise there. She died in her sleep, Kathy Corey thought. Not too surprised because of her age, but really? I mean, you saw a cushion on top of her face. But a little shocked given how active the woman was. On autopilot, they found the envelope Swift kept in the house with instructions for what to do if she died. It was a representative from the cremation society that told them to call police. The killer's motive soon became a burning question for both families as it became clear it wasn't money. It's really strange, isn't it? Like he stole the freaking rings killed them hey thanks Patricia there you go I gotta have a donut and some coffee all right <laughs> yeah uh, let's see the mind plays terrible tricks when you have the person out on the streets she said Oh, wait, let me do this part here. Hi. 
hot beverage and donut. Yeah, sounds great. The killer's motive soon became a burning question for both families as it became clear it wasn't money. In Wheel's home, the keys to her car was sitting on an end table in the living room, untouched. In the table drawer was a stash of cash, and in her bedroom, a cedar chest full of jewelry. It's almost like he'd be called the wedding ring killer. Swift's purse and wristwatch were sitting out on a table. So that just shows you right there, I mean, just really simple things to have stolen. Nothing's touched. The person went in, killed the women, just took their wedding rings and left. That's crazy. What do you think that could be psychologically? Like... I wonder if that makes the killer older, too. Like a wife. Maybe somebody left him at one point. And then he... I don't know. Bizarre. What do you guys think? I don't know. I don't understand why he would kill older people and then take their wedding ring. He's not a... This guy was a serial killer. Yeah, he's not... Uh, you can just tell by listening to it. He's a serial killer, not a thief. He went in there to kill. I don't know how you can say he was unorganized, Michelle. I don't know where you come up with that. He hasn't been caught, and he did the same thing each time. Cut the telephone lines, went in there, killed them. He thought he killed the one. She doesn't even remember anything, but... And he took their wedding rings, and that was the whole M.O. right there. No, I don't think the killer was a woman. Yeah. I just don't know where you'd think he was unorganized. Yeah, he just... But that just means he's going to use what, what's there. He g goes into the house... It's really e listen when somebody's 85 years old like that it's not like it's uh, you know you have to be Arnold Schwarzenegger to do anything I mean it's just literally you go in there he doesn't even need a weapon he probably just grabbed the first thing he saw I mean don't you think it's pretty simple to have your own weapon so to me it seems like that's an, that's an intentional part of what he's doing because it's simple to have your own weapon, right? Like, just bring a knife with you and go, yeah, yeah, yeah. But he used knives that were there and a glove, probably. And that's why there's no fingerprints. So I think it was very organized. I think he had a... Um, and he didn't, and he would just leave the, the weapon behind. So now he's not going to be tied to a weapon that he got somehow by leaving it there, uh, accidentally or intentionally, whatever. Now he's just using an item that's in the house with a glove, leaves it there, no fingerprints, and then it's just like, whoa, he used this. No fingerprints, but we can't link this to him because she bought this years ago. So, I don't know. I think it's, he hasn't been caught, so you got to look at it like that. I don't know, it's hard to say if he's young or not, because you're talking about he's a serial killer and wanted rings... He could be, you know, maybe it's like um, a kid whose parents got divorced and he blamed his mom. And he thinks that that's what made him who he is. Yeah, maybe. Could be that, Jay, but it's hard to say. So it could be like, hey, you know, and the, way, and the ring sort of is symbolic. Like he's killing his mother who... Um, you know, got a divorce, but it was her fault. Like, she cheated, so now he's out there killing older women, taking their wedding ring as sort of the trophy of killing his mom over and over again. Something like that. And then Jay said, a man who was in his 60s when he got dumped and felt his marriage was a sham, 
he seeks revenge on yeah I mean that's you know it's in the same ballpark there same kind of thing I actually think this is one of the more interesting cases we've talked about in a month <laughs> you know it's weird how you just stumble upon these it, it's crazy I mean Yeah, and they said he seeks revenge on widows that were likely married happily, the ring, symbolic happiness that he couldn't have. Yeah, you know, that's very similar to what I was just thinking. I'm thinking more like he was a, a, a son and his parents got divorced, maybe. You know, if it's an older person, then your scenario is probably closer. Uh, got, got divorced, but he blames his mother for his shitty life, and you know, and then he's out killing. And it's weird too because none of these people are still married again. You know, they're not like remarried. They're they're all single, elderly women. All three of them. One just happened to live, but she was meant to be dead, and her ring was taken too. So 75, and I think 82 and 85, or basically 85. Crazy, huh? Jesus. The mind plays terrible tricks when you have the person out on the streets. Investigators at the time told them the forensic evidence showed Swift stayed still through the attack. Wow, overrules her said. She imagined her grandmother paralyzed by fear. I can totally see that. Maybe telling the attacker to take what he wanted. But unfortunately, the, the kill, he was there to kill and to take the wedding ring. That was the whole goal. Wheel, on the other hand, Fought back, detectives said, according to Smith. Okay, now which one? Hold on. And is it Eleanor Swift? So Swift didn't. Let me read that again. Ah, Jesus. <laughs> what the hell was that? That was crazy. The stupid driver booster thing popped up on my screen. Whew. I gotta put some sound effects to that. That was it, Jay? No follow ups? <laughs> Yeah. This gives the time told them the forensic evidence showed Swift stayed still through the attack over Holzer said she imagined her grandmother paralyzed by fear maybe telling the attacker to take what he wanted wheel on the other hand fought back detectives said according to Smith they found a can of mace spray on her dresser just out of reach ah geez. that's amazing back all the way back then huh? before she was buried they yeah wasn't she the one that was nervous let me just make sure. What what are we at here? So wheel. Now wheel's the first house. Right? So that's weird because that's the one the other one was she was all gregarious and everything. It was the other one that was scared and like kind of nervous all the time. Um, and that would have been Swift. 
So it's strange. It seems like she would have had the one with the mace. She would have been the one with the mace. Yeah, or, you know, a 17-year-old, a kid that had those wouldn't be attracted, you know, for like 80-something years old. So it could that could explain it, too. I mean, he, he's there just to kill a motherly-like person that he is angry at to and then take the wedding ring as a reminder of how his mom divorced his dad and ruined his life. And so he's not there to, it's not, there's no sexual motivation at all in the crime, you know. That's what I think. I, I don't think there was a sexual motivation regardless of how he, you know, what, what was going on there. Yeah, it could be, you know, definitely could be an older person, yeah. But I don't think, I don't think the, there was any sexual motivation whatsoever. The wheel, on the other hand, fought back. Detectives said, according to Smith, they found a can of mace spray on her dresser just out of reach. Before she was buried, they put a scarf around her neck, which is interesting. That, you know, Around her neck, it covered the mark left behind by the belt used to strangle her. For both families, the deaths left gaping voids. Overholzer, a senior in high school at the time, turned to alcohol in college. For a decade after, she couldn't trust anyone, she said. Even God, her strong Christian faith, shaken with the anger of how it could have taken away her golfing partner, her role model, role model and her confidant. The shock of this really set my life on a different course. It's weird. It's weird how deaths like that just you know it's sort of like the you know Robert Frost the path not taken you just a death all of a sudden you're on this other path that you were never on and you just never know what your life would have been like had that not happened you know a lot of things change you know the whole butterfly effect ah come on Jesus here we go getting into the, the profiling now yeah it's weird the uh, I don't know it's just it's just strange you know you know it's really weird it's just my whole situation when my brother died it, you know, like I like I've told you guys before at the time, you know, me and that Ty Burrell guy, he was the best friend I ever had. I mean it's so strange to say that, but like we were we would do everything. Skits in the hallway and everything. And then after my brother died I just kinda went into a shell and then he went off and now he's on that fa that sitcom, you know, modern family. But it's strange you know, and I haven't, I talked to him once, I think, after that, but it just, I totally turned into a zombie for a while. So it's weird, you know, you wonder, like, gosh, if we were buddies, would we have kept doing stuff and would he have ended up being an actor and doing what he's doing now, kicking ass like that? Or what would I be doing? Everything's totally different at this point. Yeah. Yeah, it could be. Uh, Jay, that's a little, little, little specific for me right there. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know what he is. I think if they were all in the same church, that probably would have been brought up in, a, in an article. It would have been interesting. Uh, something, a point that they would have... Yeah. Yeah, it's funny too, because what's really weird is like my whole life, um, I was, everybody's always said, oh, you should do play-by-play -play or B 
be on the radio or do something. And I never did any of that stuff. I never, I, I did get a communications degree, but it wasn't in any kind of broadcasting. I kind of wish I had done that. I'd probably, probably be a hell of a lot more polished or whatever. <laughs> but um, it's weird how I am now doing here what everybody always said I should have been doing. Which I think is interesting. So now I'm right here, you see. I'm doing, and it's just so strange, you know, the serendipity of it all. Uh, it's just really weird. <laughs> yeah, I went to the Art Institute. I, uh, I mean, just to tell you, this is this is basically uh, in a nutshell. I sucked in high school. I didn't give a shit about school at all. I just had my hormones are going. I'm just looking at the girls all the time. I just didn't give a crap about a damn thing. Okay, so. And my grades were so bad that I had to go to uh, Western Oregon State College first because they accept lower GPA. So I went there, and then I had to ha do a certain GPA so I could transfer from there to go. Then I transferred to the University of Oregon. And when I went there, I you know, I did okay. I just didn't care either, though, you know. And so I was there, and I was in the dorms, and that's where I met Ty Burrell. Then my brother died probably six months into the school year and that just turned into a nightmare it was just like you know and then i tried going there the next year it just sucked and you know i was just really down and out the fraternity i was in was that's where my brother died i was in the same fraternity they're all like oh get over it get over it get over it so then i just left the freaking school uh my parents just said why don't you go to oregon state so i went to oregon state the first term there, I again, I just didn't give a shit. I got, I actually got a point six because I just didn't even go to class or anything. I just wanted to party and just do. I mean, you have to try hard to get a point six, okay? Uh, but then it seems like about a the next year, I actually started going. Hey, wow, this is interesting. Some of this stuff. So then I got, you know three five you know good gpa but my entire college gpa was shot at that point but you know i at one point i was actually thought it was interesting and the thing is i should never even have gone to college until i was about 22 or older even like 24 it seems like it's a total waste when you're really young like 18 years old you're over there why not do like trade school or something and then when you're 22, if you want to go to college, or 24, then go. Because now you're kind of an adult where you're ready to learn and really just take your time and learn stuff. When you're 18, man, you just get out of high school, you don't really, <laughs> you don't give a crap, right? So anyways, I got my degree. Uh, I ended up with 220-something credits, which is 40 extra, you know. And that's not a lie. That's... Uh, you know, that's a real thing. Uh, I just was all over the place, you know. I did get a pretty broad education, though. Anthropology, all kinds of crap like that. Uh, but then after that, I worked at Nordstrom's right out of college for a while. Uh, two years there. Uh, just absolute waste of time. Uh, a joke, really. Uh, I worked in stockroom and sales. Then, then I got this job as a trucking broker. <laughs> I just can't even imagine. Worst goddamn job in the world. Then I was just sitting around just going, man, what am I going to do? So I was just talking to my mom and she goes, hey, Gray, you need, to, you need a skill that people can use, you know, that actually, you know, is useful to somebody. You need a skill. So, um, I went to Columbia. We picked a school called just one of those trend, you know, like a, almost like a vocational school, but for computers or whatever. So I went to a place called Columbia College of Business. A yeah, trucking broker means you find people that have shipment that needs to be sent. And then you find truck drivers 
and you charge a different amount to both. You pay different to the trucker and that. Okay, it's really kind of basic. So anyways, uh, I went to Columbia College of Business and got a microcomputer application specialist certificate. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of funny because it's just, you know. But I learned how to use all the crap, you know, Excel, uh, Lotus, I guess, at the time. Uh, I was already good at typing. 10 key, you know, now I can just go if I want to. All kinds of stuff, just learned the basics of all kinds of... And I was there for six months, and then, then I got a job at one bank. That's the job that sucked where that one girl would say, Hey, Gray, how do you do this? And I'd say, Well, you do it like this. Correct, 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 she'd say. And that's where you guys all type in the correct, 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 correct button. So after that job, I, I think I got fired from that one because I just it just sucked. I mean, it was horrible. Then I got a job at a bank. Um, it was one of the first banks involved in the entire financial crisis. But it was way, it was just before all that stuff. But it was one of the ones doing all that crap. But I worked there for seven years, and the first job I got, I was just a collector. And then after that, I became a uh, sort of like this analyst <coughs> person. Where, but it was cool because on the job request, they put, uh, <laughs> listen to this, on the job request, you know, it was an internal job, they put microcomputer application specialist certificate a plus because they basically made the job just for me and I got that job. So I was working there and then that whole company collapsed. And let's see. So I was sitting around again in a weird state and my again my parents see this is lucky to have parents like that I was able to go to the art institute and I went there for animation and media arts okay and I went there and I, I mean I it was like Dean's list because now I'm doing something I'm totally interested in uh, you know, all these crazy animations. It was cool. Uh, 4.0 the whole time. I did that for two years, and then I started doing business. Uh, me and a friend of mine named Troy Thirdgill. He's a African-American comedian. Funny as hell. I mean, he's absolutely hilarious. I mean, just, you know, amazing. And so we, me and him went in business together, but, you know, just didn't really work out that well. And then right near the end of that time... Because it was, uh, we went into business doing um, videography, and I was going to be using some of this together. Who, who are you talking about, Princess? I'm just talking about something totally different right now. Is this the same person again? Who is this right here? Are you guys listening to my, are you interested to hear this long ass story or what? <laughs> I don't even know what's going on right now. I wasn't even looking at the... Okay. Yeah, so I was at the Art Institute. And, uh, you know, did, got great grades there. That's where I came up with some of my short stories that I've told. Uh, learned how to sketch a little bit. I learned 3D Studio Max, Maya. Then I, then, I, then me and my friend started that videography company. Uh, he was always gone. Uh, it just really didn't really work out. And so then, right near the time of that, in about 2007, my friend Ken said, hey, we need somebody. And it was weird, because this now goes back to the microcomputer application specialist. We need somebody that can... Um, you know, collect data for us. So I was doing this crazy automation stuff for them. And then they eventually hired me at that company. And then um, I got laid off from there. They, I got this itchy thing here. I got laid off from there. Um, God, what was that? 2000 and... Well, actually, it wasn't even that long ago. I worked for that company for seven years. 
and I was already doing these videos when I started working for um, this company that I work for now. But I do automations for them uh, at a different level. I learned uh, Python in like 2000 and, yeah, what was that? Well, probably 14 or 13, I learned Python on YouTube. Just loaded up YouTube videos, watched, learned it, use it all the time now. And now I work for another company with the same guy, Ken. I kind of, he always takes me with him. It's pretty cool because he goes somewhere and then he wants me to go there because I'm the one, one of the few people that does like ad hoc, quickly, you know, some kind of thing that he needs, a tool or something. So I've got that. And, uh, you know, it's weird how everything sort of, molds together because I went to the Art Institute the digital stuff that's how I'm able to use these programs that I'm using to do the shows then these crazy transitions like these ones right here these are all done in 3D Studio Max you know and uh, it's just everything kind of goes together and the thing is you can become creative uh, the more knowledge you have about something the more creative you can be not sure why there's itchy spot right on the side of my nose right here. So, you know, there's a lot more detail in there. You know, but I just thought I'd throw you guys out the craziness. So it kind of just shows you that you can do whatever the hell you want to do. Just go do something. You know, tomorrow, go learn something. You know, you never know if you'd like it or not. But I got to tell you, computer programming is actually fun. I, I You know what? I guarantee it. All of you in here would like to learn how to do like Python or something like that. Especially if you had something that you wanted to do with it. Like, I always thought it'd be cool to create a program in Python. As soon as there's a case that you are interested in, you type their name in, then the Python goes out and scrapes the internet, internet for everything related to it and start shuffling it off, either files or information into a folder of some sort. And then you just, boom, you've got it all. And it goes back in time even. So it starts using some of the Google date range stuff. Ding, 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 and then just sort of loads it up. And then you can kind of sift through it and find. I think that would be amazing. Might have to build one of the, build that someday. Yeah, but Python is just uh, a crazy, simple little program. It's free. There's no, it doesn't cost you a nickel to have it. And there's different programs where you can install all the different libraries, and they're all free, too. And you just uh, go through the tutorials that they got online. And by the time you're done, you're able to just do stuff. And then what's crazy is you just go to, like, there's a site called Stack Overflow, right? So you just type in something like, um, let's see, you know, create a database, or not even, that's something simple, like copy text from a text file into a list in Python. And you type it in, and go, watch how simple this is, watch this. I'll just show you this on the screen right here. So watch this. Um, Copy words. Oh, you can't see it. Let me get to that one. Hey, look at that. I caught myself for once. So watch this. Uh, copy. Let's see. Read words from a, a text file into a, a list in Python. Okay. So there you go. You just go here and then you... Right, read down here, Stack Overflow, boom. And then you see right here, right there, there is the command, right there. So you put a file, and right here you can actually type in like C colon backslash, all that shit right there, here. See right there, F equals open, and then here's the document. So if that's in the same directory as your, your uh, Python code, 
it'll work. But if not, you can actually put right here like C colon forward slash and put the folder names and all that kind of stuff, right? So then it reads the text file all in the memory, and there's the little R there for read. And then it says for word in, see this right here is now, this whole thing after it, it opens it up, this thing here is called F, right? So then it says, it reads it all in, and then it says for word in F. So that means after it read all this stuff into memory, for each word in F, then print the word on the screen. So it'll just print them off. It'll loop through that one and do it, okay? So look, at it. it's so freaking simple. And all the code's just sitting right here. And then you can just change it up to match what you want to do. You could, you could call that G equals open that. And then right here for, for word in G, just in case you'd use F prior to that. So anyways, everybody, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah, I think you guys, uh, you guys would have fun doing Python tutorials. Because you'd think, holy shit, I could do this. <laughs> Even though you're, listen, my average age is, uh, that watches the show is 35 to 45. But then the next one is the next older age group. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Jay. Who? Who's he? I would just tell him to learn Python first on YouTube. That's it. That's freaking nuts. I mean, literally there's this guy on YouTube that was talking like, yeah, so man, listen, and he had these corny jokes all the time. And that's how I learned it. 40, he had 40 freaking uh, videos. And I went through all can of them. Can you recommend a good online learning program so he can learn to do programming CAD or graphic design? Cost doesn't matter. Long story. No, you don't even have to, you know, just have him go through a, a user on YouTube. Right, watch this. I mean, if you just type, go to YouTube and type in learn Python. What? Oh, wow. Is that, is that him right there? Oh, that's, uh, I don't know if he's still out there, but it was like, I learned Python. His name was like Dusty Bones or something. Is he still out there? Uh, I wish I could find that original guy. He was hilarious. But. Learn Python. Yeah, full course for beginners right there. All right? So you just go to that and boom. Like a grouping. So here's this guy. I mean, you could just, I bet you if you click on his name here, freecodecamp.org, he has 2.65 million, right? Look at these. But I would just go to one that has, try to find one that starts off just at Raise, the abs really absolute basic shit and just go right through it. Yeah, just go to YouTube. There's all kinds of places out there, but why not just do it for free? Yeah, well, kids at that age can learn that stuff really easy. You just have them follow along what's going on, and then boom, they're doing it. And yes, everybody, I know it's been an, a lot of uh, donations and stuff going out, but we got to keep up the uh, keep it up for the end of the month. We're getting we're on the home stretch. Mo Sunday night, I'll try to do something earlier in the day, but I got to get up at five thirty the next day on Monday to drive all the way up to Seattle, and then I'll try try to do a show that night. So. Yeah, Python's 
Uh, I think everybody's doing Python now. It's so easy, so simple. Python, do like 3.5 or above. I'm not even sure what... They might even have a 4 now. I don't know. Let's see. Now they have 3.8 at this point. It was 2.79 for a long time. Now it's... Yeah. Everyone always says, oh, I'm going to do a channel. I'm going to do a channel. You know, it's it's really not, you know, unless you're just, I don't know how you, sometimes people get lucky and they stare into the screen and they somehow get these algorithms. But uh, other than that, it's, it's pretty brutal for a long time. Okay, I, I, I did have one more that is in the title, so I have to get through this one. Pretty wild, though, right? I mean, you've got a, you got a serial killer that basically killed three women. That one just happened to live, but it wasn't intentional. And took three diamond rings, cut all three phone lines, and then the MO... Let me, let me check something out, though. Hold on. What year was that? was 80... And maybe three was the number, right? But the second one, the person lived, so they might have went into hiding at that point. That's not really what they would type in. Let's see, woman kill wedding ring stolen. Weird. This is 1987, just two months later. Elderly residents who say once lived behind unlocked doors have armed themselves as police hunt for a killer blamed for the rapes. And uh, Now there's rapes, though. Slangs of three elderly widows. <laughs> that's, that's pretty weird. I mean, maybe now he moved into that realm. What do you think of that? That's really kind of weird. You got to admit. And we're also talking about Mississippi, which isn't far from here. It's right there. So, Huh. And three again, right? See, the whole three thing was a little bit weird. Let's just read through this and see what, if, what else we got here. 
Elderly residents who say they once lived behind unlocked, sto unlocked doors have armed themselves as police hunt for a killer blamed for the rapes and slayings of three elderly widows. Again, three widows during the past five months. I've not, I'm not scared, but I suppose that could rain, uh, change real quick. I've got a gun and I'm not afraid to use it, Francis. Frederary, a 78-year-old widow, said Tuesday. Police have increased patrols in the central city neighborhoods where the three widows were slain. The most recent victim, Addie Reed, 80, was strangled and beaten. Jesus. Hello. Last week in her home, police said she had been raped. So now we've got rapes, though, that are different. However... Maybe that was just something else added, you know, later, like he, uh, the next phase. Maybe there's another three of another type. My son was all for moving me out the day after it happened, but I said there's no way. Uh, other residents agreed. Uh, let's see. Another elderly widow said she was afraid to go outside. I took around three or four times to make sure no one's around. I want to know about the phone lines. Look around to see if we see anyone. Police Chief L.C. Smith said the theory that the crimes were committed by the same man is based on... So they think these are all committed by the same man. I got to save this. This is... Uh, that's too crazy at this point. And this is 1987 April. And he left that area, right? Right after that one? Jesus. All right. It. I'm just going to save this and put it into that main. Let's see. theory that the crimes were committed by the same man is based on similarities in the slaying and evidence obtained from the victim on March 25th rape. That victim survived. Here's another survivor. An attempted strangulation. I mean, this almost sounds like the same freaking story. Probably because the attacker left thinking her dead, just like the other one. How, how weird is that? By the types of injuries and how the people are being killed, I have no doubt in my mind that we're dealing with one individual, said Dr. Rodrigo Galvez, a pathologist and psychiatrist who developed psychological profile of the suspect. I, I, I think there's a chance this is related. He declined to discuss his findings further. Especially given that it's only two months, a month and a half later, in a state that's only one state away, elderly people being killed, strangled, and the only difference now is now they're being raped. Police say all four, and that's weird because remember the previous article, it said that particular MO went away. Well, that, you know, almost like they were hinting that there were some that were similar, but there's a little difference to them now. We have never had this type of thing before, Public Safety Director Jim Black said. This is the city's first serial killer, as far as I can remember, and I have been with the police department more than 30 years. The surviving victim gave a description of her attacker, but, the, but, the, but Black said police aren't sure how accurate it was because the man knocked off the women's glasses as he forced his way through the door. Black and Galvez said they believe the killer might target younger victims, a possibility that 29-year-old Gail Watts, who lives near one of the victims, said 
is something she feared since the first sling. Although it's a pattern of elderly victims, no one can predict, she said. My friend have told me not to worry because I'm not elderly, but my reaction has been that anyone would do something like this is capable of anything. So this is in Mississippi. Mary DeWitt, 81. That was November 21st. Sorry, November 21st. So that would have been 1986 then? for that strangulation. Bertha Tanner, December 21st, so it'd be 86. This is in uh, Jackson, Mississippi. Oops. An autopsy showed that an 83-year-old woman whose beaten body was discovered Friday in her central Jackson home died of strangulation and Hines County Coroner Robert Martin said she probably was sexually assaulted. So it's weird. If it's the same person, he got three rings and now he's sexually assaulting three other elderly women in a state one state away around the same time except this is before this is 1986 this is um, three months prior to those victims there's overlap it's crazy I mean this is it's not common to have wi elderly women be the victims of serial killers so the fact that you've got six elderly women eight victims though two left for dead by in each situation so eight elderly women who were meant to be killed by this killer all within a two-month period within two states of each other you don't think that that's possibly related i do i mean i think there's a good chance you know I might actually call over there and see. Police would not comment on their investigation. Strangled. She was tell. She was strangled with a telephone cord, interestingly, which was wrapped loosely around her neck. When police found her dead, the assailant had pulled it so tight, the skin had folded around it. He said, "She also had been badly beaten." So that's similar. Right there. Evidence suggests DeWitt was choked. Ah, God, I gotta, I gotta save this, too. This. Bertha Tanner. Thanks, Rochelle Black. Hey, just to let you guys know, we're about half of what we normally need to stay on pace tonight. I wish I had something on the screen that would show, but I, I don't. So. Uh, this is 1986. And we're talking about 
twelve fourteen. Six uh, let me get I'm gonna move move that other file in there too. That's crazy. Martin, who witnessed both autopsies, said the injury to each woman's body appeared similar. Okay, what are you talking about now? Evidence suggests the wit was choked, but she died as a result of the beating, which caused a brain hemorrhage. After his preliminary investigation at the Tanner scene, Martin said the cause of her death appeared to be beating as well. Like the wit, Tanner apparently was beaten with hands or feet or both. Martin, who witnessed both autopsies, said the injury to each woman's body appeared similar. The coroner said no determination can be made on whether Tanner was sexually assaulted, but he said we, we could surmise that that did take place. Tanner's body was discovered partially nude, her feet tied to the bed frame with her legs spread, Oh wow. Tanner's body was discovered partially nude. Her bot her feet that's different. That's a big difference. But if you're changing your MO to add sexual assault, then this is definitely something that you know could have just been added, right? The coroner said no de determination can be made on whether Tanner was sexually assaulted, but he said we could surmise that. Tanner's body was discovered partially nude her feet tied to the bed frame with her legs spread. If she was sexually assaulted, Martin said it probably happened while she was alive. Authorities have indicated that the wit who died about three days before her body was discovered may have been sexually assaulted. Martin said tests haven't been completed to confirm that. Ah, well, look at this. They they made it, they got an arrest. I didn't even think of looking until just now. Number of victims four. I wonder if they ever thought that maybe this guy. They they caught him and well, I don't know how when they caught him though. Let me type this guy's name: Gregory Davis. That's interesting. Oh, so this isn't too long after this. Photos used to try to find serial killer. So this is April 1997. Okay. Wait, that's that's the uh, oh, Gregory Davis. Why did that article pop up? How is that? How did that happen? Oh, because her name wasn't switched. Davis maintains innocent in note read to father's congregation. All right, let's see. So 1987 to 1988. So this isn't too long after that. Neighbors say suspect raised in strict home. Gregory Davis charged Tuesday. See, it's weird too because this is... That's why he maybe just totally disappeared off the map. Because if this guy is the killer in the other cases where... Uh, man, they need to check on this. Because he was arrested after those cases in Florida. So, Gregory Davis charged Tuesday in the city serial killings was described by relatives and friends as quiet, loner, raised in strict home. The 21-year-old the eldest son of a Baptist preacher worked off and on 
at a local grocery store and liked to play basketball and video games. He stayed near his family at 232 Erie Street home. Uh, Davis' family didn't learn of the allegations against him until after Mayor Dale Danks' 6 p.m. news conference. A police searched the family's house Tuesday about 6.30 p.m. Wow. So I gotta, I gotta save this. Man, I wouldn't be shocked at all if he was traveling to Florida in between doing different things. It's just too similar other than the sexual assault aspect of it. Cool. Well, I got that. I'm going to contact them and say, hey, if you guys, what did you guys come up? Did you look at this one? Look at that. He killed to avenge relative. <laughs> Let's see how similar this is to what we were saying. The lawyer representing Gregory Davis said the accused serial killer wanted to avenge his ill grandmother by doing wrong to other white ladies. Alvin Binder, who is defending Davis, said the accused man sees white people as the other side and he is so paranoid. Well, see, this is a black individual then, right? And they were saying that the brown hair left behind at uh, two of those scenes was from a white person. As the other side, and he's so paranoid, he won't even trust his own family. Was oh, this him right here? No, that's not him. I don't know, it just seems... God, what are the odds of that? That you'd have two elderly killing serial killers in within about 500 miles of each other? I don't know. Who knows? Let me. I'm still gonna check in on this. Let me. I'm gonna save this out though. But what a what a cool night though. Stumbled upon uh, two serial killers, or at least one. <laughs> but I mean, this is crazy. Never heard of him. So apparently, I think that's him right there. Gregory Davis. All right. Well, that wasn't even the one that I was trying to get to, though. And look at right here, he's a serial killer. Rape, mutilation, necrophilia, even. Wow. Sexual fixation on older women. A 59-year-old, 81, 83, 80. Crazy. Jesus. Oh, which one, which one did you want me to read? The... Uh, this thing? Yeah, I read part of it. It just seemed like it was... I could just read this one, I guess. The lawyer representing Gregory Davis said the accused serial killer wanted to avenge his ill grandmother by doing wrong to older white ladies. Alvin Binder, who was defending Davis, said... She accused, uh, the accused man sees white people as the other side and he is so paranoid he won't even trust his own family. Binder's comment made in his opening statement apparently was intended to strengthen Davis's plea of innocent by reason of insanity. Testimony began Wednesday in Davis' capital murder trial 
amid accusations by the defense that it would be difficult for the 22-year-old black man to be judged fairly by an all-white jury. Binder said Davis' elderly grandmother suffers complications from diabetes and the defendant believes he can atone and avenge these sufferings by doing wrong to older white ladies. Yeah, it sounds a little different than the other one, but man, at the same time. A former technical college student, Davis is charged with capital murder in the March 31, 1987 strangulation death of 80-year-old Addie Reed. If convicted, he could receive a death penalty. The trial was moved to Forest County because of pre-trial publicity. The evidence will point strongly throughout the prosecution case to Gregory Davis, but Davis was insane and didn't know what he was doing, the lawyer told jurors. He believes God has forgiven him. We believe the evidence will show he has lack of remorse unlike normal person. Binder said psychiatrists and psychologists who examined Davis for the defense will testify that the that his thinking is confused, he has delusions, and he hears voices. Davis has been diagnosed a paranoid schizophrenic. At age 13, Gregory Davis started hearing voices, and his behavior began to get bizarre, and his voices started telling him <clears throat> what to do and to do things to people, Binder said. He said Davis has the mental maturity of a 13-year-old. Uh, let's see. Anyways, there you go. I'm going to check this stuff out. <laughs> Crazy. Crazy. Anyways, there was another elder, well, not elderly, but another woman killed in that same county uh, a year later of the original stories that we were talking about. always send me emails about just crazy shit I don't know I'm just gonna go do my own research on this one I'll get I'll get back to you guys I'm gonna try go try to find other people don't send me emails on what you know I, I like to do that on my own okay uh, let me open up this uh, I think that was the first one this is another one a 47-year-old Palm Harbor woman was found dead in her garage Sunday night in the Patsy Ann subdivision. It appears to be suspicious. June L. Mobley of, uh, let's see, 2225 Laughing Gold Lane. Can't be more than one of those. Right in that same general area again. Probably an apartment, I guess. Unless there was something else there before. This is 1988, June Mobley. Now, I haven't seen him re uh, taking any rings or anything like that. The things that were similar were beaten and strangled, but then there was sexual assault. Um, I don't know. They might not be related, but it's so crazy that they're not far away from each other and same time frame exactly. Let me check the map. Go back in time. That looks like there was still apartments in 94. 
So. An autopsy was performed Monday on the body of 47-year-old Palm Harbor woman found dead Sunday evening, but the results were not available Monday evening. Uh, the body of June L. Mobley was discovered about 7 p.m. Sunday by her son in the garage of her home at 225 Laughing Gold Lane in the Patty Ann Acres subdivision. Uh, he said detectives have not classified the death as, as a murder because we're not really sure. I can't release any information. Let's see. Oh, it's that same, look at that, Bochicchio, same guy in there. A neighbor, Rita Jorgensen, described Miss Moberly as friendly. Okay. Then another article that day, autopsy results awaited. An autopsy was performed Monday on the body of 47-year-old Palm Harbor woman found dead Sunday evening, but the results were not available Monday evening. The body of June L. Mobley was discovered about 7 p.m. Sunday by her son in the garage of her home at 225 Laughing Gold Lane. He said detectives have not classified the death as a murder because we're not... Okay, I think that's kind of similar. Looks like almost the same quotes. All right. And then two days later, a Palm Harbor woman died Sunday. She was born in Detroit and moved to this area in 1976. She was an employee of A.C. Nielsen. And that's just where, you know, a death announcement. And about two and a half years later, then they actually talk about it. June was the most kind-hearted person you ever saw, said one friend. She was always coming over here with cakes. If she went away on a trip, she always bring me a present. This is the friend who declined to be named because the killer is at large. On September 18, 1986, Court records show Mobley filed to end her marriage of 29 years to John Charles Mobley, a retired homicide investigator for the Detroit Police Department. Oh boy. The two had married August 17, 1957 in Detroit. At the time, June was 18 and pregnant, her relatives said. According to... The court documents, the marriage was ir, uh, irretrievably broken, a common phrase used in divorce cases. Exactly why she sought the divorce couldn't be determined, her lawyer, Jim Dodson, didn't return telephone messages. Her husband's divorce lawyer, uh, Hamden H. Baskin, declined to discuss the case. John Mobley declined to be interviewed except to say he thought the sheriff's office had been very thorough in the investigation of his wife's death and that he understood it may have been an accidental. June Mobley sought alimony. Here we go, everybody. And this is so... All those cases that we talk about. June Mobley, and you know, he worked all those years, he had pension, and he didn't want her to have it. This is, that's just how I look at it. I mean, who, who stood to gain with her dying right during a divorce? John Mobley declined to be interviewed except to say he thought the sheriff's office had been... Okay. June Mobley sought alimony consistent with her needs and the ability of the husband to pay as well as equitable distribution of personal and real property they both owned court documents show. On October 8, 1986, Mobley asked the court to give her the home they shared at 225 Laughing Gold Lane in the Patty Ann Acres subdivision of Palm Harbor. She said she suffered from chronic lung problems and that she was afraid of her husband. Documents show. Oh, boy. She cited an incident five days earlier, according to the motion, when Mobley allegedly hit her in the face at their home. In order to protect the wife from the further abuse by her husband and in order to prevent deterioration of her physical and emotional status, June Mobley should be awarded the house, the motion states. 
Circuit Judge Harry Fogel ruled in her favor on October 22nd. The judge said John Mobley should be allowed reasonable access to the house daily from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. with reasonable notice to his wife. Fogel also ordered the husband to pay June Mobley $60 weekly. That's it? That's nothing. That's not something that you would, you know, maybe the house was a problem. Uh, John Mobley was a real estate agent who bought delinquent tax certificates on real property in several counties, court records show. He filed a motion on October 22nd charging his wife had removed 13000 from a bank account used to purchase the certificates. She should pay back the money if the facts warrant it. On March 11, 1987, June Mobley asked the court for a temporary restraining order against her husband. She cited two incidents. Two days earlier, she charged in court documents seeing the order her husband telephoned and said he wanted his guns. He said he wanted the weapons, the motion states, in order to shoot the wife. Huh. On March 10th, he followed June Mobley home and said he was not afraid to die and that he and she would die within minutes of one another according to the motion. The motion states Mobley lived alone and was terrified for her safety. So this is exactly the shit we've, yeah, it, totally controlling, you know, like Sarita said, textbook. The motion states Mobley lived alone and was terrified. Fogel issued the restraining order. John Mobley was ordered to stay away from the home and forbidden to contact, threaten, or follow his wife. In a letter dated May 13, 1987, the husband asked Fogel for help. John Mobley wrote that the attorney's fees were high, that he had been kicked out of his home that day and his money had been taken and that he was on the brink of bankruptcy. June Mobley is mentally ill, the husband charged in the letter. I am a retired police officer and have never ser served such a, uh, abuse of law. I've never observed such abuse of law. In the letter, he added he was caring for his legally blind 84-year-old father and his 80-year-old mother, who he said was crippled by Parkinson's. On August 20th, 1987, John Mobley was found in contempt of court and given a 15-day suspended sentence for disposing of some of the tax certificates in violation of an earlier order divorce record state. He avoided jail by turning over the record, court papers show. Uh, he was found in contempt again and given a suspended 30-day term on January 30th, 1988 for failing to file an affidavit about the tax certificate with his wife's lawyer. He was given until no later than February 1st to comply and again avoided going to jail. Six days after that deadline, June Mobley was found dead. The divorce went through. Uh, let's see. Coming Monday... June's last hours and the effect of her slaying on the son who found him. Huh. Well, I think I have that one. That's the next day, right? Mm. Well, anyways, it's already kind of obvious what happened in this one, but it's it's not. It's a cold case. They never were able to pin it on him, if you can believe that. Oh, the next day, February 8th, an autopsy solved the first mystery. Someone had killed Mobley by choking and severely beating her in the head and chest. See, those are all things that he knew. He knows that those things are hard to, you know, determine who did something by doing those types of things. Six of her ribs were broken as well. So that was personal. It became obvious 
said that the killer tried to fool investigators into believing Mobley accidentally fell to her death from the fold-up ladder. That made sense to family member, Mark Mobley said, because it, his mother never tried to get into the attic. She always asked for her sons uh, to retrieve things. Huh. Anyways, I got this one. Yeah, it just seems pretty obvious here. I might check check it out later, but let's see. What is what is this? Two thousand and three. One last one. Vacationing in New Hampshire. Let's see. She asked neighbors to check on him when I think this is her name's mentioned in this article. Right there, 1988, the body of 47-year-old June L. Mobley was found in the garage. She had suffered trauma to the upper body, and detectives classified her death as a homicide. That case remi remains unsolved. Well, that's because the husband knew exactly what to do. And, and the thing is, is the way he killed her, all of his DNA is totally explainable that might be around the house because he lived there too. He could go there whenever he wanted. So basically, she dies. There's damage. But if he wore gloves, <laughs> even if he dropped a hair on the ground or anything like that, it it's totally reasonable and explainable. So, man, that's just so dangerous. Anyways, I think that's going to be it for me tonight. Thank you guys all for showing up. I'll let you guys can sit around and chat for a while if you want, but I am going to I'm going to go watch some television or something. <laughs> all right. So thank you guys for uh hanging out tonight. And thank you for uh really low on the super chats for the donations, but Zozo, Lee D, Angie Panji Lane S, Lori H, Zozo, Cairo, Zozo, Linda Howe, Lee D, Darlene White, Lee D, Kim F. Sharp, uh, Donna Bolton, Upgraded Membership, and then Karen K, thank you, Patricia M, Rebecca, and Rochelle Black. Thank you guys very much. All right, make sure you wear your mask, maintain your social distancing, and wash the hands. Oh, thanks, LM. Appreciate it. Yeah, I've been doing this true crime thing for quite a while now. And during this whole time, I have not seen one person that is a crime dissector. Like rejecta, I'm a certified human lie detector. Thank you. Gonna get ya on a stretcher. Oh, thank you. you. Play me like an old projector. Crime sector is my nectar. Professor Gray is gonna give another lecture. Crime collector, freak connector, and I'm always gonna be a pup protector. Fool deflector, interceptor, and I'm meaner than a specter with a vector on his pector with all respect, ya. Just remember, I've a temple fucking checkcha. I have no agenda. agenda. I'm, I'm a pretender. pretender. And I'll serve it to you straight without the blender. And in the end, I'm gonna send ya on a mission to reveal the true offender. Wow, that was yeah, crazy. Get right back to work. Right. Some weirdos showed up tonight. They're always trying to get you to talk about something that they're not even talking about. What? Well, they're trying to get you to oh, forget it. You're so mean. Okay, good night, Mary Lou. Good night, Jumbo. You're so mean. <laughs> Be safe out there.
All right. Thanks, Nona.
Oh, sorry about that, but I'm stopping the, the streaming part, but you can keep typing. You can keep chatting for a while. 